Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm joining you from today, the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. There is no place in Australia, water, land or air, that has not been known, nurtured or loved by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Associate Professor Alice Motion um, and I'm from the University of Sydney and I'm also the host representative for the University of Sydney as part of the Australian Citizen Science Association's um, Management Committee. That was a little bit of a mouthful. Um, it gives me great pleasure to um, uh, open this EMCR afternoon that we're dedicating to um, EMCRs. For those of you who aren't familiar with this acronym, one of many that we have in the university spaces, uh, this means early to mid-career researchers. Um, and in particular this afternoon, we're going to be looking at the ways that um, citizen science research um, is undertaken by EMCRs in Australia, looking at some of the challenges and opportunities for this group of people, um, and thinking about ways that we can better integrate the EMCR community with citizen scientists, with policy um, associated with citizen science, and to really advocate for citizen science in Australia. This session wouldn't be possible without a lot of people, and I'm going to do some thank yous at the beginning of the session before giving a little bit more information of what we've been up to. And first and foremost, um, we'd all like to really sincerely thank um, Laura Navarro um, and the Theo Murphy Initiative at the Australian Academy of Science, um, whose uh, financial support through a grant that um, we were awarded last year and significant support from Laura, who's just been a wonderful person to work with and continues to be a fantastic advocate for EMCRs in Australia. Um, and this is the Theo Murphy Initiative are the main uh, sponsors for this afternoon. So we'd really like to, to thank you and to thank Laura in particular. We'd also like to thank Jen Loder, who um, was the leader of this grant that enabled this project. And folks who've been part of an EMCR working committee that's been led by some of the people you're going to meet today, uh, Dr. Yela Golombic, Dr. Pat Bonney, um, who, will, who I'll introduce in a moment and will be taking charge of this session, um, but also our colleagues, um, Dr. Kobe Calix, uh, Dr. Jack Nunn, Associ Nunn excuse me, Associate Professor uh, Anne Border, Dr. Sam Illingworth, and many others who've contributed to this uh, working group. Um, and we hope to have some more members after today. That's part of uh, what we would really like to, to build is community and connection and collaboration. Uh, and we know that this is so important to uh, EMCRs and to the citizen science in the university sector. Today, we have uh, three sort of key workshops. Um, they're actually in two sessions. So we're on this platform for the first session and we're going to zoom over to Zoom uh, for the next uh, session. Uh, the first part of this workshop that um, Dr. Golumbic and Dr. Bonney will be leading um, is going to focus on the future of citizen science research. We're going to be looking at challenges, op solutions and opportunities, uh, particularly with um, a lens of EMCR researchers. We know that it can be challenging being, being an EMCR researcher. Wherever you are working, you're trying to set up your career to establish yourself, to build a group, to reach out for the right opportunities and to build collaborations. And there are uh, particular challenges for those who are trying to work with members of the community and to co-create um, solutions to many of our biggest challenges. And so we're hoping to build um, a community today who can help to um, support each other as we work through um, some, of these, um, some of these challenges. In our second session, we're delighted to be joined um, by Professor Hugh Possingham, who's the Queensland Chief Scientist, who will um, give the plenary talk um, as part of that session. And then we'll move into an interactive discussion where we'll be trying to cover some of the following questions. Uh, firstly, how can universities better support EMCRs working in citizen science research, education and practice to deliver impact? Secondly, how can AXA better connect and support EMCRs working in citizen science. And thirdly, 
what should our AXA EMCR community of practice be focusing on over the next year and beyond? And an invitation, a very warm invitation for you to join us. This is certainly not an exclusive group. You don't have to be an EMCR um, to be part of this process. Indeed, of course, we want to work with citizen scientists, with practitioners, with people in policy. Um, we'd like to work with everybody. And we really want to establish those connections. So before I hand over to um, Yela and Pat and introduce them, I just wanted to highlight some of the work that's been ongoing in the MCR working group that's been enabled by Theo Murphy and uh, the wonderful support of AXA. So when things went, uh, uh, when, when plans started to go awry in 2020, I'll try not to mention the C word, uh, we shifted our plans uh, for a conference and we moved to, uh, to run an online conference in October last year, I think almost exactly a year to this week. Um, and we were able to run uh, an EMCR session and to start to build a community to gather thoughts and to work towards uh, some of the things we wanted to build as an EMCR community um, here in Australia. And out of that, um, we have worked to, um, to build um, some documents that we will be sharing and to think about some of the ideas that we would like to focus on. And in particular, uh, one of the great outcomes has been a, a lunchtime seminar series that has been ongoing um, each month. And you, if you've missed some of those sessions, the great news is that you can head to the Australian Citizen Science Association website and you can catch up. Um, and you can also um, look out for those that are advertised regularly, regularly through the AXA newsletter and also from Yela and other members of the team. So there is a lot of energy in this uh, in this space. There are a lot of fantastic um, EMCR researchers or EMCRs um, who are working in citizen science and learning from each other um, and who are here to support you if you're in that position or want to work with uh, members of the community uh, in many and various ways. And we're going to hear from some fantastic people today. And the first two fantastic people that we're going to hear from are Dr. Yela Golumbic and uh, Dr. Pat Bonney. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give a brief introduction to both of these people. Um, I know Yela particularly well. I have the great pleasure of working with her at the University of Sydney. Um, she's a wonderful person to work with. She's, the she's a research fellow in our group, and she's a, the principal researcher of the Learning by Doing Citizen Science Project, which you might hear more about this week. Um, she has long been uh, somebody who advocates and uh, focuses on citizen science in her research um, and uh, specializes in thinking about ways to make a dialogue between uh, the different groups um, involved in citizen science. Dr. Pat Bonney is a fabulous social researcher examining citizen science and natural resource management of waterways. And he's currently a research fellow at RMIT, RMIT University, uh, where he's doing some wonderful work that you will learn more about today. So um, with thanks to everybody who's joined this session, um, hope to hear from many of you throughout the day and to see you in our second session later. I'll pass over to Yela, who will uh, take us through um, the rest of the program. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Alice, for that wonderful introduction and for introducing the uh, EMCR working group. Um, and today's session is actually a product from conversations we've had with early and mid-career researchers over the past year since that first initial uh, conference uh, or online uh, sessions that we had um, last year. Um, and the session today brings together researchers from different stages of their academic career, from PhD students, mid um, early, mid, and finally uh, senior researchers. Um, and we're going to reflect and discuss a little bit the different challenges uh, and uncertainties that many EMCRs uh, are facing when they're doing um, their research, when they're trying to advance their career. Uh, and particularly when we think about citizen science, that it's not just advancing our research, but many of us are also involved in um, social aspects, working very closely with communities, uh, working with volunteers. And so there's a lot of social impact that uh, is very important for many of us and balancing those different um, 
responsibilities and expectations that we have is sometimes a little bit challenging. And so we're going to try and discuss that and talk with people that have been through that, uh, who have experience, maybe people that are experiencing that right now, and uh, try and have a discussion and see how we can establish ourselves as EMCRs, as independent researchers, how we find the right fit within academia uh, and better ways to collaborate together and share our experiences. And so I'm going to uh, introduce very, very briefly the speakers that we have today, just maybe by one sentence each, but I will give them time later on to introduce themselves. Uh, and so we all get to know um, all the members, uh, all the speakers today. So firstly, um, Leah Marks, she's a PhD student at the University of Sydney, exploring the potential of citizen science in prevention health and policy uh, and practice. Next, Dr. Vicki Martin. She's an environmental social scientist uh, and currently working as a postdoctoral research fellow at the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Queensland. Associate Professor Will Cornwell is an associate professor in um, University of NSW. Uh, and he is working researching the ecology and um, evolution of plants and particularly in the impacts of climate change. Professor Greta Pesco uh, is a professor of marine ecology at the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies at the University of Tasmania. She's also the director of the Center of Marine Socioecology, and her research focuses um, on species and ecosystems response to climate change. Professor Lauren Ricards um, works at the School of Global and Herbal Social Sciences at RMIT University. Uh, she's the interim director of the Urban Futures ECP and the co-leader of the Climate Change Transformations Research Program. She studies the urban rural and human nature relationships. Uh, and finally, Dr. Pat Biney, who Alice uh, introduced uh, before, he is um, also my uh, co-host uh, for the session today. So he will be uh, joining and asking some of the questions and introducing some of the topics that we'll be discussing today. Uh, he has also um, been the co-host with me in a series of lunch seminars that we've been running uh, once a month. Um, and we can discuss more of that later today. Um, so um, Pat is an awesome researcher looking at citizen science and uh, nature resource management, particularly at different waterways. Um, and he's a research fellow at MIT University um, as well. Um, so I invite all of you uh, to join us here uh, in the panel. And we will start maybe by getting to know everybody a little bit better. Um, so I will ask um, for each of you to maybe take one minute to introduce yourselves in any way you want, but particularly to also include your involvement in citizen science. I'm just going to leave it open for whoever wants to start. Well, we're a shy bunch. <laughs> Where you go, Greta? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> um, so as, as mentioned, I'm a marine ecologist. Um, I started working in science because I just thought fishing and diving and splashing around in the ocean was a pretty cool way to spend your time. Um, and then gradually got into more uh, interdisciplinary kind of work, working with economists and social scientists and people working in policy and law and, and things like that. Um, I became pretty passionate about citizen science because I realised that we were not connecting with a large part of the people that use, you know, the oceans and the places that, that I was I was passionate about and, and interested in understanding. And we weren't connecting to the knowledge and the information um, in a large part of that community. So I started a project called um, REDMAP or Range Extension Database and Mapping Project that looks at how species might be shifting where they live with climate. Yeah, I'll finish then. Yeah. Maybe I'll go next because Red Map was pretty dear to my heart. In um, my PhD, I was looking at marine science communication and citizen science as a tool for connecting more Australians with science. Um, so hand in hand with the national science engagement strategy that was saying uh, being a, a that. Um, Australia is a marine nation, perhaps um, 
marine science is a good way to get more people involved in science more broadly. And then, of course, the science communication literature was really um, pushing this participatory approach to um, science communication, which is why I started focusing in on citizen science. And I was very fortunate um, that Greta agreed to let me use REDMAP as a case study um, in, the, in the research, and that got me um, more heavily involved in looking at citizen science from a social, social science angle um, and led to a pretty fabulous um, postdoc over in the US at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology where I got to really dive into some questions about who's participating in citizen science and how can we broaden the types of audiences that, that come and get involved. So, yeah. Thank you. I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> so, hi everyone. I'm Lauren Rickards. I'm at RMIT. Um, my background's in um, ecology and then through to human geography. And that transition, um, which occurred sort of during my PhD uh, process and a, and a bit earlier, really um, kind of is where my interest in citizen science emerged as part of a kind of interest in science policy, science practice. A lot of my work's been looking at rural and agricultural uh, questions uh, where the participatory model has been um, particularly well uh, rehearsed, critiqued, um, reinvented many, many times. And now my, most of my work is around climate change, including in um, IPCC Working Group 2 with Greta. Um, and there, of course, there's you know, huge um, needs for all of the benefits that citizen science can uh, produce and most recently, um, I get to work with Pat, who you'll hear from in a moment. Uh, we've done some work um, looking at sunscreen in Port Phillip Bay, uh, and more recently, uh, looking at broader questions around um, circular economy solutions, such as biosolids through to uh, agricultural use. So thanks, everyone. Perhaps that's a good time for me to jump in there, too. I think I underwent a similar transition, and I started off as a freshwater scientist working at the University of Melbourne and was increasingly uh, aware that the problems that we face in waterways are uh, as much a, a problem around, you know, working with communities and with people than it is about the actual science that we're doing. And, you know, that was where my interest in citizen science um, came from. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to do a PhD on um, the long-standing water watch programs that have existed across the country for, for almost 30 years. And, you know, it's a remarkable history, a uh, really rich history that these programs have. And my interest in citizen science was how these programs are connected with government agencies, their contributions, and most importantly, how they build capacity in communities to um, address local waterway problems. Um, so I'm looking forward to speaking with you today uh, about citizen science and I'll be asking some questions around, you know, how do we create that impact? What are the challenges that we're facing? And, you know, what sort of research is needed to adequately meet the challenge that we're facing? Maybe, maybe I'll jump in there. Um, my name is Will Cornwell. I'm a terrestrial ecologist and I've been interested in citizen science for, for a very long time. I started using it for teaching because there's fantastic teaching tools to get uh, undergraduates and high school students really engaged in science. And then I started to use it for research questions, looking at population trends and how you can use and what are the, the pitfalls and advantages in citizen science data, looking at for population trends in particular species. And then I guess the most recent chapter of, of my work on it has been after the 2019 2020 bushfire season there was all this fantastic interest in what's coming back across the burned landscape in terms of species plant species animal species fungi and people were taking lots of pictures and throwing them up on facebook pages and discussing it and we thought it was a fantastic opportunity to to, to get people to actually put that data somewhere where we can use it or where everyone can use it for studying recovery from fire. So we launched launched a project after that big fire event and, and got lots of engagement all across the fire grounds, which was fantastic. I'll um, jump on in. So my name's Leah Marks and I'm a PhD student with the Australian Prevention Partnership Centre based at the University of Sydney. 
And my background is in public health and I first came across citizen science while working on a pilot citizen science project led by my supervisor, which really aimed to engage the public in monitoring workplace support for breastfeeding. And that project really sparked my curiosity and interest in the potential of citizen science as an approach to strengthen how we engage the public in research and decision making in chronic disease prevention. And that has since evolved into the focus of my PhD, um, which is really around exploring the potential for citizen science in policy and practice in prevention. Um, and through this, I've really explored how citizen sciences citizen science approaches have been used in prevention and trying to understand how these approaches align with existing practice um, and how they might be used to complement the work of policy and practice organizations in supporting health and well-being so i'd say i'm still quite new myself to to this field and i'm really excited to hearing and learning from the other panelists and their experiences in this field Okay, well, thank you, Leanne. Thank you, everyone, for introducing yourself. I think it's really great to get to know you a little bit and also to see the, the, the diversity of, you know, all the different things that you're doing. Everybody's working, you know, in different kinds of fields. And I think that's, it's just, it's fascinating. Um, I'd also just want to let everybody know that uh, we're going to capture what we're uh, sort of discussing today, actually, uh, in a graphic kind of way. Uh, thank you, Thanks to the Theo Murphy funding that we received, we were able uh, to engage Kath Leach from uh, Catfish Creative, uh, who is gonna mm -hmm. capture uh, this session as a graphical uh, facilitator. Uh, so all those outputs will be then shared with the community. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get some uh, really interesting findings. And so the first question that I wanted to ask you um, to reflect on today, um, is to think about yourself as early uh, career researchers. That will be easier for some who are at that stage right now. Um, a little bit more difficult for the senior members, um, senior speakers today to reflect and remember um, a few years back. Uh, but I would like to try uh, for you to think back at your career or think at your uh, current experiences as EM EMCRs uh, and to share with us uh, maybe a particular experience that helped shape your career or shape the direction of your research? Whoever has an idea first, you can just jump in. <laughs> I'll jump in if you like, um, in that um, you know, I had a couple of very uh, dramatic <laughs> um, moments of pivoting in my in my thesis and uh in my um career and going back to my master's thesis which was on the forest ecology um of the cloud forest of tenerife which is one of the um islands um the canary islands uh, of spain and down towards africa um i was busy doing sort of the ecological field work all the samples you know looking and in my quadrats and transects with machetes in hand trying to push through and one of the kind of challenges was that only there's only a very very thin band of this forest with a perfect ring around this volcanic uh, shaped island and we kept uh, getting the edge effects and so it was just a very very thin band and so the, the forest was different um, on each side where the uh, agricultural land had been cleared and effectively there was only one percent of this land cleared and the kind of question that just kept going through my mind was why I was trying to study this sort of pure ecology of this forest when it was already so disturbed and there was only 1% left and the 1% was under more and more um, threat. And I said to my PhD, DPhil supervisor at the time, look, I think I really want to study the question of these threats and, you know, why there's only 1%, why it's still under threat. And he said, oh, no, no, that's not a science question. No, you, you can't do that that's beyond the bounds of of what you're doing you know get back to your quadrat sort of thing and I did and I did and I did but I just got to the point where I was just so concerned <laughs> about the broader social context that um in a fairly messy fashion I extricated myself from that <laughs> uh by which stage I'd also done half a PhD on it I should have said uh and started again over in human ecology looking at 
the threats to conservation and questions around that. So it was just that moment where the real world was really um, kind of imposing in on, on the scientific questions. And it was quite a um, moment of uh, realisation, I suppose, of both the value of the science that I was doing, but also it's um, the limitations for it to answer certain questions and also to perhaps change policy. So I've kind of, that was quite a um, transformative moment and I've kept both the love of the science, but also concern uh, about these broader policy questions. So I hope that was the sort of tone, I'm not sure if that was the sort of answer you wanted or something quite different. That was perfect. Okay. Who wants to go next? Maybe I'll, I'll jump in. I had a very early experience with citizen science as a high school student. I volunteered on this project counting um, white crowned sparrows, white crowned ground sparrows. And I just remember a very distinct memory of going out and counting the sparrows, writing down all our data, learning how to collect data. And then I had this feeling when I gave the data to the, to the organizers that it just kind of got stuck in a drawer somewhere and might not actually have gone, go anywhere. And I, and I really remember being demotivated by that idea that I couldn't actually track what was the effect. As a, as a participant, I couldn't actually see whether that data was going on to be useful for science or for the broader community or for anything. And so I think like what I think is really important in, in this context is that the participants really can see the process all the way through to the scientific output at the end. And that's really what I took away from from that experience as a as a participant. Thank you. Well, that's uh, really amazing that you participated as a high school student. We always say that citizen science is you know something new or something that's expanding. You know, in the past maybe ten years, but I'm pretty confident that wasn't in the past ten years. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next, uh, anybody else want to share some experiences? I'd be interested to hear what Leah has to, said, to, has to say mm -hmm. as an early career PhD person here. Yeah, definitely. Happy to jump in. Um, as, as you say, I'm still very much in my ERC days, so I maybe don't have the clarity of uh, that comes with reflection over years, but... Uh, maybe my more relevant experiences to our discussion today around some future directions in citizen science comes on the back of really recently sort of conducting interviews as part of my PhD with a really diverse range of sort of policy and practice stakeholders working in preventive health where I've tried to sort of gauge um, levels of familiarity, interest, what people see and conceptualise citizen science to be. And I think what's been, uh, what continues to sort of ignite my interest and passion in the field is really hearing the passion and interest from policy stakeholders to integrate citizen science within their broader community engagement strategies to strengthen how they connect and collaborate with members of the public and the, the interest they, or the potential they see in these sorts of approaches to really, um, bring stakeholders together to, to help address complex issues. And I think that's something that um, sort of continues to drive my my interest and motivation to, to be involved in this field. Thank you, Leah. I think um, policy is something that I think we've discussed quite a lot during the EMCR sessions that we've had. Um, Pat, I think, is particularly passionate about that. Do you want to build on that? Uh, sure thing. I mean, I think just reflecting on my experience as a, as a researcher far, I mean, I think we're trained to be these uh, observers, these truth tellers, um, you know, fly on the walls, um, looking into the, the citizen science field or other research disciplines to try and understand and, and provide solutions. Um, but I think at my stage of, of my career, I'm also looking to, you know, create impact beyond these traditional metrics of research publications and, um, you know, or be judged on the amount of money that I bring into a particular department. And so, 
I think that's where citizen science is a really fantastic uh, practice is that we are able to uh, try and generate uh, impact beyond these uh, traditional metrics. And um, it's also a trend, you know, I've, I've noticed in academia where there are increasing expectations. Um, but there's also a critical need for us as researchers to be, um, you know, enhancing this impact beyond these metrics, as, as I mentioned. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a question I do want to um, ask the panel at some point, but for, I might just leave it there uh, for now until we uh, move on to other, other topics before we get. Yeah. Vicky, you want to go next? Sure. Um, in terms of something that profoundly um, changed my early career research experience was having an enthusiastic and supportive supervisor. Um, many of you know that was Greta, and um, I, I literally wouldn't be here today or have had the experiences that I've had so far without that support because I, I, I wasn't getting that from my um my immediate supervisors. I'm so grateful that she took me on and so grateful that she not only opened my eyes to what was going on in citizen science around Australia, um, she opened my eyes to working with um, really high performing interdisciplinary teams. She opened the doors. She, she was the one who suggested um, applying. Is this the... being recorded? I hope this is being recorded. <laughs> I'll use it in an you ad. Put it in your review. <laughs> But, you know, um, it was Greta who suggested applying for the postdoc at the Lab of Ornithology. Like, I literally thought there's no way that they will be interested in a social scientist from, you know, this little old town in Australia. But, um, you know, she, she believed in me and she was my cheerleader. And I was also very fortunate um, because I know she's super, super busy, um, and she was at that time. She's even busier now, so I realise now I caught her at a good time in her career, um, and that might be something to think about when you're approaching um, supervisors and other advisors. It's, you know, everyone's super busy, but as Greta has been climbing up um, the ladder of her career, um, I know she's be become even busier and, and harder to, to reach, but... The thing I've appreciated about um, Greta too is that on her way up this ladder, she is the one who's turning around and helping out so many people, um, particularly women in science, up that ladder as well. And so finding those champions, finding people who will support you um, and maybe open your eyes and challenge you to, to look at things a bit differently too is, is uh, really key. So thank you, Greta. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for all that. That's you know really lovely and and heartwarming to to hear. And one of the you know the best parts of, of my career and the the you know opportunities that that I have and the things I get to do is is sort of helping and supporting other people's careers. So that's wonderful to hear. But it also reminds me of one of my own challenges early on in my career. Um, and a lesson that it taught me, and that's that if you, know, if you have a good idea and you genuinely think it's a good idea, then you then you know really try and stick with it and and push it. So in in your case, you know you had fabulous ideas, and and you, you know occasionally you needed a little bit of nudging, but you had really good ideas and and you stuck to those, and that's paid off. And in in my case, I was, you know, I came up with this idea for for Redmap and. Everybody told me it was a silly idea. It took me three goes at getting it funded. Everybody was, no, 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 you won't get information from fishers. Nobody's going to tell you anything. People won't give away their spots. Why would they do that? You know, why would they give you photos? All this kind of, um, you know, negative commentary around the, the concept. But I, I thought it was a great idea, so I stuck with it. And, and, you know, 10 years later, it's a program that's still going strong. So one thing that I learnt pretty early on was to, you know, stick to your guns when you've got a good idea. By all means, get feedback and listen to, to other people. But if you, in your heart of hearts, really do think that something is, is a good idea, then, then you know, stick to your guns and, and pursue it. That's amazing feedback. Thank you. And I love that there's um, some uh, people that know each other and have experience with each other can build on upon um, what people are talking. And I think that is also a really great segue to our next question, uh, because you were talking about some of the challenges um, that you've had in sort of the 
beginning maybe of, of your career or of you know new ideas. Um, and I think particularly in citizen science, this is something that we often find when we're working in citizen science, but a lot of our peers or colleagues uh, maybe are not working in that space. So maybe uh, they're working in, in the same overall discipline, but in more traditional ways. Uh, and so working in citizen science is something that often people may question and, you know, may feel that maybe you're not using the most um, um, methodological, um, accurate ways. Um, it's also quite difficult because as we can see from the panel here, all of us working in citizen science are placed in different faculties, in different departments. It's a little bit hard to get us to collaborate together. So just looking at the panel, we have Leah from the Faculty of Medicine and Health. We have uh, Vicky and Will that are in Earth and Environmental Sciences. Greta is in Marine Science. Uh, I myself are in, in, in the School of Chemistry. So we have quite different uh, disciplinary backgrounds or uh, faculties where we are part of. Um, and that can get quite challenging. Um, and I think even more than that, as early and mid-career researchers, when we're looking to establish ourselves as independent researchers, when we're looking to find the right fit for us, for our academic growth, on one hand, there's so many options. On the, on, on the other hand, we don't really fit to any of those boxes. And that is definitely something that I've found challenging in my uh, growth in citizen science and trying to find my own place. Um, and so I guess my question to the panel is, firstly, do you have any kind of similar experiences? Um, what have you done in order to get that support that you need? Uh, and what can we do as early career researchers to find the place, to find the fit to accommodate our research? Um, I'll, I'll jump in there quickly if, if I can. I could talk about that area for a long time, but I just wanted to touch on one thing that you said about not fitting into a box or not, you know, not being able to find your particular, um, you know, peers that are working on the same thing as you. That's actually a good thing. It can be a very frustrating thing sometimes, and we all want to have um, people around us that can relate to what we're doing and that we can get support from and whose work we can build on, but sometimes not having um, people around you that are working on the same thing actually means that there's room for you to move and grow um, and to fill a gap and to fill a niche, and that can that can feel very uncertain and scary, um, but if you can't find the people around you doing exactly the same thing as you, then that means that there's, you know, room for you to to grow and, and to, to do new things and make new connections. So as long as you've got the support to do that bit, um, that's a, you know, a good thing sometimes. Yeah, and I'll just build on that. I mean, I absolutely agree. It's this sort of like two sides of a coin. It's challenging, but it can also be a huge advantage, particularly if you find yourself in the right institutional environment. Um, you know, one of the things we... Um, you know, often a, a kind of, you know, push to kind of think about is what are our academic outputs and what are our kind of social impact or, you know, um, beyond academic outputs. And it's in that academic space that I think sometimes citizen science can actually be challenging because on the one hand, you know, peer reviewers and journals can kind of be sniffy about the data. Um, on the other hand, you might not want to write a full-blown sort of social science Piece and so you know finding the homes there. So I think everything we can do to advocate for more uh, flexible um, publishing formats and stuff, I think, is really important. But in terms of the the social impact stuff, sometimes I think we look past social um, citizen science as a method and focus on on the broader impacts that we're we're aiming for. You know the ones that often sort of come up with sort of motherhood type statements, um, but. There's something to be said about focusing on citizen science itself and um, there's not a lot of uh, focus in some of that broader academic discourse around a method-based connection, but that's really what we're sort of talking about or an approach-based connection. And so coming back to your role, like it's about being an intermediary and linking across different topic areas, different objectives, different disciplines, um, and seeing those commonalities. And I think there's a lot of scope to actually develop innovative insights 
by getting those different perspectives on it. So it's sort of if you understand the landscape and what's being asked of you, you can kind of see how to fit and how to play um, those kind of different games, if you like. Thank you. Maybe we'll uh, open this to also some of the um, uh, early career researchers. Maybe you can um, um, say um, talk from your experiences uh, around this uh, theme. I can jump in. Um, I mean, I guess adding to some of the really good points made as a PhD student, I would say a lot of the things you mentioned, Yala, did resonate with me and. I'd say PhDs can be quite solitary work and they can be quite reliant on ERC sort of having opportunities and the skills to really build connections and network with those working in a similar space. I think I've been extremely lucky to have the best sort of support I could ask for from my supervisor, Sam, who's sort of really built a program of work and I'm really just riding on her coattails. So, I'm not sure I have the best advice um, around how you find that. Um, I've, I've happened into it and um, couldn't be luckier for it. But I do think um, sort of really putting yourself out there and building sort of relationships with stakeholders, um, whether they're in academia or not, but those who have sort of common principles and goals in the way, the way they work, um, to try and develop partnerships around citizen science because I think one of the benefits of citizen science is that it can really bring together quite a diverse mix of stakeholders around a common issue or to address a common issue. So whether that might be working with sort of those working community organisations or in policy and practice or in other university institutions or um, just members of communities themselves, I think there even though working within the university institution can be a bit of an ivory tower um there are opportunities to sort of network beyond um those university connections that you might make through conferences and other things that are more readily open to you as a as a university researcher and i might jump in there leah too i i was just reflecting on you know the different um ways that I've viewed citizen science or practiced citizen science. Um, you know, beginning with my PhD, I was you know, conducting traditional social science research, doing interviews with a variety of stakeholders, volunteers, decision makers, scientists, all interacting with the program um, in various ways. Um, since then, I've established a uh, community-led uh, environmental stewardship program out here uh, on Gunai Kurnai country in, in East Gippsland where uh, it is a, uh, it's seen my role uh, as a researcher be completely transformed. Um, I'm not here observing the, the, the processes as much as I am facilitating community uh, and their connections with different agencies, ensuring that their voices are heard in decision-making, a variety of other skills from even, you know, social media engagement, which is something I never expected that would be a part of my role. And so, you know, this is all in view of trying to create some kind of impact because when we read academic literature, you know, we're constantly sort of told or recommended that we try to implement more co-created forms of citizen science, community-led forms, place-based research, you name it. There's a variety of different uh, terms that are currently used around, around these ideas. And so what's been so surprising for me as a, as a researcher is, um, not not being as i mentioned before as a as an observer uh, or or as a passive um, observer of, of citizen science but one that is actively engaged in the issues that are affecting a particular place a particular community and so i guess my my question i might open this up to to others to to draw on is um thinking about those metrics about the need for me as an early career researcher to uh write and publish and um, acquire grant funding and these sorts of things, but with this other sort of aspect, this social impact, um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in knowing from uh, perhaps the more senior researchers in the panel that we balance these competing priorities um, uh, that, you know, perhaps within citizen science. Um, does anyone have any uh, ideas around that that they might like to share? I could probably 
probably chip in with something that may not help or apply in in all cases. But one thing that I tried to do with my Red Map Citizen Science project so that um, I was making everybody happy with it, if you know what I mean, if I was at, well, I was achieving academic outputs from it, but also um, being able to do the less academic things that I thought were really important, but uh, um, things that can't be measured, you know, metrics that can't be measured, was to try and um, evaluate and, and, and publish on various aspects of this citizen science project, not just the ecology. So I'm an ecologist, um, but I, we haven't just published on Redmap on the rain shift uh, species moving kind of data. We've looked at it in many different ways through collaborations with social scientists and other socioeconomy kind of type people. Um, Vicky's PhD work is a, you know, an example of that. We'd only been running for a couple of years when Vicky started. Um, and as for an ecology project, I need 10 years of data to be able to say anything you know, really interesting with that. But in the meantime, we were using it as a, to look at, is it bringing, you know, fishing and diving communities together? Is it is it um, successful in, in educating people on climate change? Do people feel like they trust the data? Um, are there barriers to people participating? All sorts of different um, community social impact kind of ideas. Um, but through collaborations with the right people, I can't, I couldn't have done that all on my own. I didn't have the right skill set. I think to um, run citizen science projects or to develop projects, you need to be a bit of a jack or jill of all trades in many ways, as Patrick was just talking about during the social media and this and that, and, you know, all these different aspects. So I think, um, you know, we need to have those kinds of skills, but we also need to work and collaborate with lots of different people that can help us um, build other, other parts of our profile um, that rather than just, you know, what the narrow focus topic of the particular project might have been. And Greta, how have those broader research, uh, that, that broader research that you've been doing with Redmap helped to then inform the design or the redesign of Redmap to ultimately improve its, its impact? Yeah, so we have had a, you know, a re reflexive feedback kind of loop. Um, not as much as it could have because of funding. So, you know, we've often sort of done the investigations of how could this be better? How would the app be better received? Um, you know, what kind of media and communication might work best with different communities, but then just not had the funding to, to actually do that. So one of the biggest challenges I've had is, you know, a consistent funding stream. So Redmap has run on the smell of an oily rag for the last couple of years. Um, and I think part of that challenge is that there is a perception there that it's citizen science is cheap or it should be free. Um, and yeah, not, a, not a lot of recognition that it's to do a quality project, it often still takes resources and time. And, um, you know, they're not things that you just met, develop and then send out to the world and people will magically give you data. I think people that haven't got experience in citizen science imagine that. You know, and then I sent it out into the world and then data magically appeared and I got to use it and that was the end of the story. They don't see and understand that there's a whole lot of other parts of that around communication and engagement and seeking feedback and um, listening to what people on the ground are doing and, and, and want and that there's actually a whole lot of value and social impact generated through all those processes. But I do think, Patrick, that the tide is turning a bit in, in academia around the valuing of citizen science specifically, but more um, social impact and things that can't necessarily be measured and shoved in an Excel spreadsheet. So I, I do feel like people are looking now for people that are um, more, more, have more experience in communication and engagement and more, more, um, more aspects of, of research that, that develop social impact. Yeah, and there's certainly not a lot of researchers who were studying um, uh, the practice of citizen science in a similar way to um, what I was. There, there are a few of us <laughs> around the globe, but it's a small handful. And so that was even more challenging to um, put the case forward for the sort of work that I wanted to do, looking at, at citizen science writ large without actually having one single project that I was really interested in um, 
and and being a social scientist in um, often in environmental studies type um, uh, uh, schools and things like that um, has added challenges as well. There's not always the type of um, advisory support that you might want to, but as Greta said before, you do have to get pretty good at going it alone or reaching out to others um, outside of maybe your core team to, to get that advice and bounce ideas off. Um, yeah, finding the right sort of journals has been a big challenge um, to publish in too, but, you know, finding those enthusiastic interdisciplinary ones has been really good. Um, finding funding. So as some of you know, I've had to kind of step away from citizen science um, uh, to a large extent. It doesn't mean that I don't think about it. I still think about it a lot, but I'm thinking um, along the lines as Pat is about broader environmental stewardship. So it's still a lot of that sort of voluntary um, pro-environmental behaviour change sort of um, that, that I think think about a lot now. So it's sort of being flexible and adaptable and um, particularly in a pandemic, my goodness, you know, the reality is I'm now on my seventh contract in 18 months because the funding keeps changing and things keep changing. So, yeah, just trying to um, be adaptable and still stay relevant is, is one of the, the big challenges. Um, well, it sounds like you'll beat my record, Vicky. I, I think I'm going for it, Greta. Yeah. <laughs> not, not that I want you to beat it. Hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll get something longer term shortly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> Vicky, I'm interested in something that you just mentioned there about uh, maintaining your relevance. Can you expand on that just a little bit? What do you mean by that? Uh, actually, that came out without me thinking about it too much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just um, what I see is like some of the, the funding I might be looking at uh, is really talking about environmental change, but they're talking more about ecology or biology and and as environmental social scientists know actually a lot of the problems we're talking about are human problems and the humans that we need to work with to bring about um, positive change to um, the environment that we're concerned about so um, just trying to keep, keep that message um, getting fed back to funders or other um, supporters of of research um, has been been a bit of a change. Like if you look at the um, Australian um, research priorities, it's quite a narrow focus on environmental change. So trying to find the right narrative that fits, you know, I want to do this work um, to achieve those environmental outcomes that you're talking about, but I see it as coming from like these human dimensions rather than, you know, maybe going out and measuring corals in the bay or whatever yeah Pat, and we'll, just, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no lauren go for it Jump in. Oh, i was just gonna um so about the big challenge is building um on you know what's been indicated in this question of flexibility and things i think one of the biggest challenges um sort of ironically is so this you know the turn to impact we all know that but it's still done uh, with a very um you know, let's say kind of standard conservative notion of how that's achieved, aka the kind of very linear research plan as if we all have a telescope into the future and we can guarantee, you know, here are the metrics and what I'm going to achieve in five years' time. We all know it's complete speculative fiction, right? Um, and, yes, it's important to get us to have a future orientation, but I think with things like citizen science, the uncertainty is even greater because you do, you know, from an ethical perspective, want to be open to their ideas and perspectives and, you know, really embrace a greater degree of flexibility. And yet we are constrained by these um, funding mechanisms, which, you know, often are, are very uh, conservative in their notion of kind of, you know, the, the guarantees that they want. And so I think one of the big challenges is to really kind of emphasise the complexity of research and to use citizen science onto the bigger question of the realities of doing research in an increasingly disrupted world, um, which I have to say is a topic I'm explicitly researching, so I'm a bit obsessed with it. Um, but, you know, I just feel like research is so badly adapted as a sector 
to the increasing realities of climate change, pandemics and everything else. We sort of just go along with this very, very kind of, um, you know, old-fashioned idea of how the world will work. I will do this, I will do this, I'll do this, I'll find this, and then I'll do this, and go right through. And I think citizen science is a great opportunity to challenge that and say, well, look, I'm going to put in place these principles, put in place these processes, and then I'm going to shape it as best I can. But I cannot guarantee what the outcomes will be, which is really, I guess, infusing a greater discovery um, ethos into what we do within the bounds of ethics as well. Um, and just to kind of shout out, I've just done a big report on this called Research Impact as Ethos, if anyone's interested in looking into it. But, um, yeah, it's a big question that citizen science can help shine a light on. Yeah, and, Lauren, I was, you know, I've... I've read that report and um, it's inspired a lot of my thinking around research impact. And I think the the framework that you present around the different generations of research impact, you know, on the one hand, having research that's just simply accessible and possibly relevant to policymakers, do something, do research that is purposeful and adaptive, adapted and targeted to the actual challenges that we're facing. And, you, and I've got a quote here from that report, actually. And, and you say that... <laughs> Yeah, if that's academic, on if your academic, wall, I hope, Pat. That's lovely. Yeah, no, <laughs> not on the wall. If academic institutions are to, are to secure their future, they need to demonstrate a genuine commitment and capacity to work with others to achieve the transform transformational changes that are needed. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, what your thoughts are. I've been wanting to ask you this question for for a while. Um, you know, when it comes to your understanding of research impact or, and the different ways in which that is currently being done. How can we apply that to the way in which citizen science is done today? Um, is there something that we're missing as a, as a community? How do we improve the impact that we're having? Yeah, well, so that's a very big <laughs> question and I won't be able to cover it all, but um, just one aspect of it, just think, you know, continuing with this idea of the linearity um, you know, I think what we have to be really careful of, uh, particularly in an environment where things are more indeterminate, which quite literally does start to limit what we can know for sure, um, we, I think, have to really embrace a learning ethos in research. You know, so we are part of the target for impact. You know, one of the impacts of my research is to learn. No one ever says that in a research proposal. Now, I want my institution to learn. I want my sector to learn. I want us to, and I think citizen science, um, you know, in a glass half full, uh, glass half empty, I should say, kind of frame um, probably, you know, mitigates against that to the extent that it's infused with a kind of like, you know, let me spread the word and, you know, may you, let, you know, sit at my feet and I will, allow you to, um, you know, pick up the crumbs and, and go and you can even participate if you're lucky um, approach through to actually we're all in this really strange world together. We all have to work together to actually make sense of what's going on. So let's actually be partners. And it comes back to what Will said about that sort of sense of kind of people being given like you know, this degree of freedom, go and do that. You know, and it's also a pedagogical thing that's coming into, into the learning and teaching space as well. It's less about a hierarchical top-down model and more about co-exploration, which doesn't mean you don't have to sort of go all, you know, new agey on it and it doesn't have to involve sticky notes and, um, you know, design thinking, but you can just have as an ethos of how you approach people that you're co-participants um, and I think citizen science is already turning in that way and, as I said, I see it as a opportunity to actually really uh improve the entire research sector so yeah bit of a challenge <laughs> yeah lauren i can really resonate to a lot of what you're saying there um and i think that a lot of academia hasn't recognized that we now society now has a totally different relationship with science than it did 10 years ago that seems to have escaped a lot of people that it's you know it we operate in a totally different world where um, people can make different comments at different times and they evaluate it in different ways and knowledge flows in totally different, through different mechanisms and, and there is no, you know, peer review and gatekeeping of knowledge 
any more to a great degree. Anybody with, you know, can whack anything on YouTube and, and disseminate it. And so I think there's a, a very, very different relationship between society and, and the scientific community and, and, and science. And a lot of us just haven't recognised that yet and caught up with that. And I think citizen science is one of those things can help the way that this new relationship needs to develop. Um, it can can help that in a in a sort of you know a, yeah a way that is informed by both sides by society and by by science. Yeah. Can I just make one final comment? Just I'm um, in response. To what you said there. This is not to imply some kind of naive kind of romantic you know love of everything that every person in the public has to say. We obviously face a post truth crisis as well. Yeah. And really, you know, what we're talking about in some of our work is ecologies of knowledge. So it's gone from a neat cultivated field, that's a kind of old academic model, to much messier yeah. ecologies. And we all know ecologies uh, can have some very negative aspects as well as positive. So. Okay. Could I just jump in? And I, I agree with 100% of what, um, what Lauren was just saying there. And I think it's interesting to think about citizen science as we're at this sort of intermediate phase where it wasn't very well respected maybe in the academic circles 10 or 15 years ago and got a lot more pushback from reviewers and editors when you tried to publish a paper. And now we're slowly getting towards a phase where you can, it gets a little bit more respect in academic circles, but we're still having this, this issue of it being a very interdisciplinary thing. And that is clashing a little bit with academic institutions. So like, like, um, mentioned earlier about everybody being in different different faculties and different fields. And so that that is a little bit difficult for the traditional academic institutions to, to deal with. Um, and sometimes it can fall through the cracks. And so I think it's really great that there are these new journals like Citizen Science Theory and Practice and um, institutions like this, like the Australian Citizen Science Association to, to kind of bring people together across disciplines. And that will really help us kind of build the momentum for this thing in academic circles, as well as sharing tools and sharing experiences and methods about how you do outreach, about how you build the community and about the, those connections between the scientific community and then the, the community writ large. And so I think it's really great to, to, to start to think about how to build, bring people together across this sort of interdisciplinary divides. Um, I might jump in here uh, with a question from uh, our Q&A, which I feel is uh, rather uh, relevant to what we spoke here. And we we're talking about being multidisciplinary um, and trying to find you know, ways to overcome the divide. But at, at the end, citizen science is not considered one field of research, at least uh, uh, in the codes of research that we have today. Uh, and so one question that we have uh, coming from the audience is, when we do have to, you know, decide and we're for, forced to categorize ourselves into one field, what do we choose? Do we go back to our disciplinary fields or do we try and find something else, something new, more innovative? I guess to me, it comes down to, you have the split between if you're studying the thing with citizen science as a method and then you still have to kind of stick yourself into the box of being an ecologist or a social scientist or because you're focused on that result versus as you, if you're studying citizen science as a method. And that's where I think we need new four codes. Um, like what, you know, if you're studying remote sensing and satellites, how satellites work and they, there is now four codes for that. And so citizen science needs kind of to create a box for, for, for really valid work like that. And I think it will eventually, it's just that things are really, there's a lot of inertia in the system. Yeah, I've never found a four code that suits the type of work I do, whether it's on citizen science or not anyway. So I'm always <laughs> challenged by that. There is no one box for environmental social scientists. Mm -hmm. But it, sometimes you need to be strategic about how you use those codes to, of course, um, you know, whether you're using those codes to put your proposal in front of a funding agency, you might, and, and you're really interdisciplinary, you might want to choose one 
that's going to put you in front of a panel that's really going to get excited about your work compared to maybe one that's like I wouldn't want to go in front of the psychologist, for example, because they would look at my proposals very differently to someone who's in environmental sciences. Um, yeah, tricky. It's always tricky for me anyway. <laughs> Um, so maybe I'll um, ask one more question that also came from the audience, and then we can go back um, to uh, some of uh, our original discussions. Um, so this is talking again about that balancing um, act that we have to do with all the different expectations and all the different things that we want to do as well from our own agenda. Uh, and so there's a question here, how do we deal with the publication output pressure that we have on the EMCRs? Um, when we have, you know, all these other expectations to do, and we're not all the successes in citizen science, as we know, are based on scientific publications. I could jump in with something quickly. Um, you could look at what the other metrics for success according to whomever your funder is or your boss um, that might include things like you know public communication or participation in public events so um, you know things that we could do are writing articles for the conversation for example that might be something that's viewed positively by your um, employer, I would say collaborating with other people as well. So you might, like often with RedMap, for example, I couldn't write a whole paper on something, but I could take a small part of the data set and contribute it to somebody else's paper with, you know, more, more data or looking at a, a bigger, broader problem. Um, yes, yeah, so I think through collaborations, you could probably get involved in uh, projects where you're doing a smaller component that relates to citizen science or relates to the to the topic that you're looking at, whether that's ecology or health or or something like that. I, I don't think there's any escaping the metric of publication outputs in universities, but there is probably you know mechanisms and things that you can do to build up other parts of of the the track record that whoever you're working for is hoping that you'll achieve. Yeah, one thing RedMap did really nicely was keep a really good record of every single newspaper article, radio interview, you know, every single thing yeah. was tracked. Um, and, and that can be really powerful if you're looking for those alternative metrics. Just dump this great big file of, all, you know, all that outreach because it can be it can add up really quickly too yeah we have hundreds now I don't, I don't i've never looked at what the latest number is but um yeah so i'd agree that's a that's a good idea but you know having, having said that all the we've just been talking about how all the things that you know matter are probably not things that you can shove in a spreadsheet but there is still a lot of things you can shove in a spreadsheet mm -hmm. just one would... oh you go Bill. I would just add that universities do love that stuff. Like at least UNSW is really happy anytime they see somebody from UNSW on the radio or on TV. Yeah. And so they do value that in addition to publications. And it is a way to stand out relative to other candidates if you're if you're going for a job, mm -hmm. um, if you have some experience in that kind of outreach. So I think there are opportunities there. Yeah, I, I think outreach has actually shifted from something that – 10 years ago was seen as a fluffy thing to do. Oh my God, how have you got time? I would get that all the time. How have you got time to be doing that stuff? Aren't you supposed to be doing serious things? You know, it's shifted from that to now being an expectation. And and so if people have got, you know, experience in a range of, of communication type activities, I think that's seen as a really strong thing for their CVs. And uh, like many people, I feel pretty strongly that we should be communicating our science or someone in our team should be doing that. It doesn't mean we all have to become public presenters or all right for the conversation, but we need to make sure that somebody in our team is doing that engagement and communication in some way 
and that the people that we're mentoring and, and working with have got opportunities to do communication in some format that they're comfortable with, whether that's, you know, written or going to public, you know, doing public talks or, or standing behind um, stalls and, and events or coming up with wacky new crazy ideas. So, you know, we've developed a, a playing card game, the Go Fish sort of game that communicates what kinds of species we're finding in local areas and what ones are uh, new. That's not something that requires somebody to stand up um, in front of somebody and do something public that they might find scary if they're a bit of a, an introvert, introvert, but it's a, a mechanism via you know, that they get to do some some public engagement and communication and everybody loves that game. And so in terms of universities and metrics, that's been a really positive thing. Or there might be, you know, other types of communication and engagement that, that uh, are more out there to require a bit more confidence and, and fit other people's skill sets. Mm-hmm. I think building on your points around outreach, it's definitely something, um, I mean, I have no uh, expertise to add around how you balance all these competing interests because I'm still figuring that out very much myself but on the program of work that I work on I'm we're very lucky that um that outreach is a re- has been built into the funding proposal and that is a really core component um as part of sort of a broader translation and knowledge mobilize, mobilization approach where sort of building knowledge communities is seen as adding a lot of value to this work. And as part of that, sort of the the program of work that I work on has established a community of practice. And through that, um, we've really built a network of stakeholders sort of interested in citizen science approaches. And I think while at the beginning, it, it can be a long process of building relationships, but that can be fruitful down the line in sort of more traditional academic um, KPIs in terms of doing sort of uh, collaborative conference conference presentations and writing papers together. And sort of one example is uh, the, the project partners, the policy stakeholders involved in that program of work are doing a symposium at this conference tomorrow um, jointly to sort of co-reflect on the program of work as a whole and how we build capacity in the field, specifically citizen science and prevention. So I do think um, even if it's a a competing demand on your time, there are often uh, benefits that come from going the extra mile and making the time to build those relationships with different kinds of stakeholders. Yeah, just quickly, just to reinforce um, all those good ideas, I think one of the um, main things we can do is build capabilities in citizen science beyond academia. Um, And so some of the work that um, Pat and I did is with an environmental NGO as a kind of intermediary. And, you know, that's an an example of where building up their capacity to do citizen science is a really positive outcome. So it does us out of a job in terms of that international development ethos. Um, but that's a really, really important thing because, to be honest, even if you just take questions of monitoring, monitoring change, monitoring climate change, monitoring, you know, that is a job that's way, way beyond what academia can do and we need more of that. So we, we have to build that that capability uh, moving out. And just another kind of thing, just coming back to that kind of research impact thinking, impact starts with your project the moment you conceive of it. Um, and who you include, how you include them, on what basis the impact is being generated. It's very much a leaky, leaky pipe. Um, And so in thinking about how to balance it all, it's about trying to capture um, all of those uh, changes along the way. Um, And you can sort of fold, at least in in social science, you can fold some of these questions into what you're doing, (laughs) uh, which then can kind of, you know, then you produce your ubiquitous academic publication as well. Now, Yela, we have some questions here. I've just found the the Q&A box. So (laughs) I might um, read some of these. Uh, We've got one here from Erin. And Erin asks, or she'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on a conundrum as she sees it. 
uh, citizen science has had to professionalize and gain recognition through academic papers, as we've discussed already, um, in order to be more widely accepted uh, in these academic circles. Um, Aaron notes that in doing so, uh, some of the language that's being used can become quite academic uh, and, and uses the, the term societal actors as one example. Uh, Aaron feels this language may be putting citizen science out of touch with the general public. Um, and the question is, you know, how do we resolve this push-pull and still make sure that citizen science is something everyone uh, with an interest in can actively uh, engage in citizen science. So coming down to those that communication and that outreach, it's about um, how do we uh, you know, speak about citizen science, um, but at the same time um, ensure that we're uh, you know meeting different needs both in academia and also within within communities uh, that might not speak the same language. I've got a pretty sort of simple and perhaps naive answer to that question. And that is with, you know, projects like RedMap, we always produce two outputs. We'll have the scientific paper and then we'll have the public version of the output as well. So in a way I see that as code switching, you know, where I'm, I'm talking one set of language if I'm talking to the academic community and I'm using another set of language if I'm talking to whatever the citizen science or the, you know, the public community is that, that I'm hoping I reach, which is something that we kind of do no matter what the output or the format is, whether that's citizen science or something entirely different. So an example would be, you know, we've got a, um, a paper out on a report card for RedMap. The, the, the paper was looking at the methodology behind that report card. The report card itself is the public communication or we might have a paper and a conversation article or a paper and a long um, Facebook post. So there's different ways of, of, you know, reaching communities. But, yeah, that would be my, my naive, incomplete answer to that question. Yeah, I think, I think you're really talking to what, um, what I was trying to say in a lot of my research is that you, you really need to tailor things to the audience that you're trying to reach. And so... This is why I've been um, concerned about some of the very well-intentioned but aspirational claims that people make about citizen science. Like, come and do citizen science. It's for all. Well, we know that's not the case. We know that just using the term science or sometimes just using the term citizen is off-putting. So um, we know that some people just don't have the capacity. They're working two jobs just to feed their families. It's not for all when we just go about it in the way that we think about citizen science. So we really have to, if we're really keen on reaching particular groups in society, we really have to rethink the way that we um, approach citizen science and, and work with people. But I guess in the same way, we, we also need to think about how that, like Greta was saying, how we communicate about it within our own circles to um, uh, so that people understand what we're doing. Um, yeah, horses for courses, something like that. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't have an answer to the conundrum, but I just wanted to um, thank uh, the, the question for, the, for pointing out the dangers of language and the ways in which sometimes if we do start there to start adopting different language, we can sort of slip into um, both exclusive language, but also meanings that perhaps we don't necessarily want. We can have pack bags that already have um, hidden baggage. So um, yeah, just that we do need to really be careful about this. Yeah, I'd like to point out just something quickly there, that it's not um, just written language either. So. Um, something that I was studying in the States was looking at the images that we're using in recruitment calls for citizen science. So um, there was a, a problem in one of the projects I was looking at. It was full of older, white, highly educated females. And guess what? They were promoting their really enthusiastic participants in their research, in their recruitment videos and images. And so it was older, white females. So, of course, when I'm trying to find out why aren't younger people participating, for example, well, they're not even going to press play on the button that 
is calling for them to participate when all they see is older people. And that's exactly what they were telling me in their interviews. They thought this project wasn't for them because they don't see themselves in that project. So we have to think really carefully about how we present citizen science if we truly are recruiting for, for all or particular groups in society. I was just going to add that I, I agree that there's this real risk of slipping towards jargon in academia. Uh, and I found actually writing for the conversation was really useful in that way because they force you to not use jargon and they take it take it all out of your writing. And so when we wrote, wrote a conversation piece about our project, it got picked up by BBC World and lots of regional radio stations. And we, it just led to this huge, um, somewhat unexpected outreach explosion. And so I think there really is a strong benefit to writing without jargon. And the conversation's great because it, it does get read by a wider um, selection of the sort of traditional media. And so it's a really good jumping out off point for citizen science, I think, at least in our experience. Yeah, I I mean, I'd add on to sort of this challenge around terminology of citizen science and agree that um, when communicating with community members themselves, you know, we know citizen science doesn't necessarily resonate with them and can be seen as jargon. So I think it places a lot of responsibility on the academics or whoever's leading the project to um, be really agile to understanding who their community or sorry, what language their community um, resonates with because it's not necessarily productive to badge um, what you're doing as citizen science. And there might be language that is a lot more familiar um, particularly from like a health perspective, citizen science really builds on a long and well-established history of community engagement in research and decision making. And it isn't necessarily seen as productive to use the terminology of citizen science, whether or not you might be referring to a, a similar approach, things like participatory research and co-creation are really big buzzwords um, and yeah, I, I guess just a, a comment that um, the end goal can be the same, even if you don't necessarily call it the same thing, but that obviously involves some level of uh, appreciation of what the right language is to use. Thank you. I, th I think this question really brought everything we spoke uh, of today to sort of a, a, a common space. So um, I, maybe with that, I'm going to thank uh, all the speakers uh, today before we wrap up. Um, so thank you so much uh, for joining this conversation. I feel that I've learned so much and got so many new perspectives. I hope this was useful uh, for everyone else as well. So thank you. Uh, just uh, say everybody's names again. So uh, Leah Marks, Dr. Vicki Martin, Associate Professor Will Cornwell, uh, Professor Greta Pet Petzl, <laughs> uh, Professor uh, Lauren Ricards, um, and uh, Dr. Pat Bonnie and myself will just uh, stick around to give a few summer summary words um, of the panel today. So thank you. Um, and while we were discussing in the background, um, so there was actually some work being done uh, from uh, Kat Leach from Catfish Creative that sort of took everything that we discussed in the background and um, made a graphic figure um, of today. So here, here it is. I can't believe that you did this so quickly while we were speaking. Um, I think it'll take us a while to read through all of this and to see all the amazing ideas uh, that come up from this uh, figure. Uh, but don't worry, we're going to be able to hand this off to everyone after the session as well. So you can uh, download it and look at it uh, more carefully. Um, I just like to, to share, Pat, a few of the highlights from today uh, that I feel that we've uh, discussed. And I think maybe the last question really brought everything together, thinking of ourselves obviously as researchers, but also as science communicators. And for me, really, citizen science and science communication is so uh, blended together. Um, and so thinking about best practices in science communication, how we think what our main message is, who our audience is, all those aspects I think is really key for us as citizen science researchers. 
Absolutely. I mean, I'm still a little bit gobsmacked by that uh, that figure that's been <laughs> created. It's amazing. Um, well done to, to Kathy. I think it's multifaceted. You know, the communication aspect is one part of citizen science, but we also need to rethink or or just reflect on all the other parts of citizen science that we're that 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 are, that are that are a part of projects. Everything from you know, as Lauren mentioned, the you know, thinking about impact from the very start. Who are we including in these projects? Also thinking about the way in which we're communicating, as we just discussed at the end, you know, what language we're using, how we're conducting um, uh, projects, uh, you know, the, the the purpose of these, these the, of citizen science too, you know, to what extent um, are they addressing some of the challenges that we're facing uh, and, and not perhaps just answering um research questions that are uh, of benefit to academic researchers only. So thinking about the broader impacts of citizen science, um, I think uh, is a, you know, it's been wonderful to discuss uh, those issues today with the panelists. And, you know, thanks so much again uh, to all those that joined us today. Uh, we really appreciate the time um, uh, and your insights as well. Yes, definitely. Um, so just uh, before we say our goodbyes, this is uh, the first of two uh, EMCR sessions of today's conference. So I think we're going to have a little bit of a break right now, uh, maybe be able to do some networking on this uh, platform that we're all joining from today. Um, and then afterwards at 3.15, if I'm not mistaken, we can, we'll all uh, join again. Uh, this time we're going off platform, so we're going to be in Zoom uh, and we're going to have the next session for EMCRs discussing um, some of the more practical uh, aspects of what we can do uh, next and how we can um, come together as a community uh, of early mid-career researchers. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you again for our amazing speakers and panelists um, and for everyone who supported uh, this today.